This is Terry by Bow Knight. I'm reading Prince Caspian by C.S. Lewis, which is book two in the Chronicles of Narnia. This is chapter three, The Dwarf. The worst of sleeping out of doors is that you wake up so dreadfully early. And when you wake, you have to get up because the ground is so hard that you are uncomfortable. And it makes matters worse if there's nothing but apples for breakfast and you have had nothing but apples for supper the night before. When Lucy had said, truly enough, that it was a glorious morning, there did not seem to be anything else nice to be said. Edmund said what everyone else was feeling. We've simply got to get off this island. When they had drunk from the well and splashed their faces, they all went down the stream again to the shore and stared at the channel which divided them from the mainland. We'll have to swim, said Edmund. It would be all right for Sue, said Peter. Susan had won prizes for swimming at school, but I don't know about the rest of us. By the rest of us, he really meant Edmund, who couldn't yet do two lengths at the school baths, and Lucy, who could hardly swim at all. Anyway, said Susan, there may be currents. Father says it's never wise to bathe in a place you don't know. But Peter, said Lucy, look here. I know I can't swim for nuts at home, in England, I mean, but couldn't we all swim long ago, if it was long ago, when we were kings and queens in Narnia? We could ride then, too, and do all sorts of things, don't you think? Ah, but we were sort of grown up then, said Peter. We reigned for years and years and learned to do things. Aren't we just back at our proper ages again now? Oh, said Edmund, in a voice which made everyone stop talking and listen to him. I've just seen it all, he said. Seen what? asked Peter. Well, the whole thing, said Edmund. You know what we were puzzling about last night, that it was only a year ago since we left Narnia, but everything looks as if no one had lived in Care Paravel for hundreds of years. Well, don't you see... You know that however long we seem to have lived in Narnia, when we got back through the wardrobe, it seemed to have taken no time at all. Go on, said Susan. I think I'm beginning to understand. And that means, continued Edmund, that once you're out of Narnia, you have no idea how Narnian time is going. Why shouldn't hundreds of years have gone past in Narnia while only one year has passed for us in England? By Jove, Ed, said Peter, I believe you've got it. In that sense, it really was hundreds of years ago that we lived in Care Paravel, and now we're coming back to Narnia just as if we were Crusaders or Anglo-Saxons or ancient Britons or someone coming back to modern England. How excited they'll be to see us, began Lucy, but at the same moment everyone else said, hush or look, for now something was happening. There was a wooded point on the mainland a little to their right, and they all felt sure that just beyond that point must be the mouth of the river. And now, round that point, there came into sight a boat. When it had cleared the point, it turned and began coming along the channel towards them. There were two people on board, one rowing, the other sitting in the stern and holding a bundle that twitched and moved as if it were alive. Both these people seemed to be soldiers. They had steel caps on their heads and light shirts of chain mail. Their faces were bearded and hard. The children drew back from the beach into the woods and watched without moving a finger. "'This'll do,' said the soldier in the stern when the boat had come about opposite to them. "'What about tying a stone to its feet, Corporal?' said the other, resting on his oars. "'Growled the other. "'We don't need that, and we haven't brought one. "'It'll drown, sure enough, without a stone, as long as we've tied the cords right.' "'With these words, he rose and lifted his bundle. "'Peter now saw that it was really alive and was, in fact, a dwarf, "'bound hand and foot, but struggling as hard as it could.' Next moment he heard a twang just beside his ear, and all at once the soldier threw up his arms, dropping the dwarf in the bottom of the boat, and fell over into the water. He floundered away to the far bank, and Peter knew that Susan's arrow had stuck on his helmet. He turned and saw that she was very pale, but was already fitting a second arrow to the string. But it was never used. As soon as he saw his companion fall, the other soldier, with a loud cry, jumped out of the boat on the far side, and he also floundered through the water, which was apparently just in his depth, and disappeared into the woods of the mainland. Quick, before she drifts, shouted Peter. He and Susan, fully dressed as they were, plunged in, and before the water was up to their shoulders, their hands were on the side of the boat. In a few seconds they had hauled her to the bank and lifted the dwarf out, and Edmund was busily engaged in cutting his bonds with the pocket knife. Peter's sword would have been sharper, but a sword is very inconvenient for this sort of work because you can't hold it anywhere lower than the hilt. When at last the dwarf was free, it sat up, rubbed its arms and legs, and exclaimed, Well, whatever they say, you don't feel like ghosts. Like most dwarves, he was very stocky and deep-chested. He would have been about three feet high if he'd been standing up, and an immense beard and whiskers. 
of coarse red hair, left little of his face to be seen except a beak-like nose and twinkling black eyes. Anyway, it continued, ghosts or not, you've saved my life and I'm extremely obliged to you. But why should we be ghosts? asked Lucy. I've been told all my life, said the dwarf, that these woods along the shore were as full of ghosts as they were of trees. That's what the story is. And that's why when they want to get rid of anyone, they usually bring him down here, like they were doing with me, and say they'll leave him to the ghosts. But I always wondered if they didn't really drown them or cut their throats. I never quite believed in the ghosts. But those two cowards you've just shot believed all right. They were more frightened of taking me to my death than I was of going. Oh, said Susan, so that's why they both ran away. Hey, what's that, said the dwarf. They got away, said Edmund, to the mainland. I wasn't shooting to kill, you know, said Susan. She would not have liked anyone to think she could miss at such a short range. Hmm, said the dwarf. That's not so good. That might mean trouble later on, unless they hold their tongues for their own sake. What were they going to drown you for, asked Peter. Oh, I'm a dangerous criminal, I am, said the dwarf cheerfully. But that's a long story. Meantime, I was wondering if perhaps you were going to ask me to breakfast. You've no idea what an appetite it gives one being executed. There's only apples, said Lucy dolefully. Better than nothing, but not so good as fresh fish, said the dwarf. It looks as if I'll have to ask you to breakfast instead. I saw some fishing tackle in that boat. And anyway, we must take her round to the other side of the island. We don't anyone want anyone from the mainland coming down here and seeing her. I ought to have thought of that myself, said Peter. The four children and the dwarf went down to the water's edge, pushed off the boat with some difficulty, and scrambled aboard. The dwarf at once took charge. The oars were, of course, too big for him to use, so Peter rowed, and the dwarf steered them north along the channel, and presently eastward round the tip of the island. From here the children could see right up the river, and all the bays and headlands of the coast beyond it. They thought they could recognize bits of it, but the woods, which had grown up since their time, made everything look very different. When they had come round into the open sea on the east of the island, the dwarf took to fishing. He had an excellent catch of pavenders, a beautiful rainbow-covered fish, which they all remembered eating in Caerparabell in the old days. When they had caught enough, they ran the boat up into a little creek and moored her to a tree. The dwarf, who was a most capable person, and indeed, though one meets bad dwarfs, I'd never heard of a dwarf who was a fool, cut the fish open, cleaned them, and said, Now what we want next is some firewood. "'We've got some up at the castle,' said Edmund. "'The dwarf gave a low whistle. "'Beards and bedsteads,' it said. "'So there really is a castle, after all.' "'It's only a ruin,' said Lucy. "'The dwarf stared round at all four of them "'with very curious expression on its face. "'And who on earth?' it began, "'but then broke off and said, "'No matter. Breakfast first. "'But one thing before we go on. "'Can you lay your hand on your hearts "'and tell me I'm really alive? "'Are you sure I wasn't drowned "'and we're not all ghosts together?' When they had all reassured him, the next question was how to carry the fish. They had nothing to string them on and no basket. They had to use Edmund's hat in the end because no one else had a hat. He would have made much more fuss about this if he had not by now been so ravenously hungry. At first, the dwarf did not seem very comfortable in the castle. They kept looking around and sniffing and saying, Hmm, looks a bit spooky after all. Smells like ghosts too. But he cheered up when it came to lighting the fire and showing them how to roast the fresh pavenders in the embers. Eating hot fish with no forks and one pocket knife between five people is a messy business, and there were several burnt fingers before the meal was ended. But as it was now nine o'clock and they'd been up since five, nobody minded the burns so much as you might have expected. When everyone had finished off with a drink from the well and an apple or so, the dwarf produced a pipe about the size of his own arm, filled it, lit it, and blew a great cloud of fragrant smoke and said, Now, you tell us your story first, said Peter, and then we'll tell you ours. Well, said the dwarf, as you've saved my life, it is only fair that you should have your own way, but I hardly know where to begin. First of all, I'm a messenger of King Caspian's. Who's he? asked four voices all at once. Caspian the Tenth, King of Narnia, and long may he reign, answered the dwarf. That is to say, he ought to be King of Narnia, and we hope he will be. At present, he is only King of us old Narnians. What do you mean by old Narnians, please? asked Lucy. "'Why, that's us,' said the dwarf. "'We're a kind of rebellion, I suppose.' "'I see,' said Peter, "'and Caspian is the chief old Narnian.' "'Well, in a manner of speaking,' said the dwarf, "'scratching its head, "'but he's really a new Narnian himself, "'a Telmarine, if you follow me.' "'I don't,' said Edmund. "'It's worse than the Wars of the Roses,' said Lucy. 
Oh dear, said the dwarf. I'm doing this very badly. Look here, I think I'll have to go right back to the beginning and tell you how Caspian grew up in his uncle's court and how he comes to be on our side at all. But it'll be a long story. All the better, said Lucy. We love stories. So the dwarf settled down and told his tale. I shall not give it to you in his words, putting in all the children's questions and interruptions, because it would take too long and be confusing, and even so, it would leave out some points the children only heard later. But the gist of the story, as they knew it in the end, was as follows. And that's the end of chapter 3.